folks. Welcome once again to the conference auditorium at DevConf US. Today, we're going to have a talk about Flux. That's the first layer of the Open Cloud Exchange. Our presenters are Ali Raza, Xumin Chen, Jacob Datesman, and Leo McGann. Please welcome our speakers. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali, and along with Min, Jacob, and Leo, I will be presenting Flux which is a hardware trading uh, system in OpenStack. Uh, all right, so before going into details of Flux, let's take a step back to the previous DevConf where we talked about the grand vision of Open Cloud Exchange. So what is Open Cloud Exchange? It's a place where multiple stake on, stakeholders come together and build a cloud where different stakeholders can contribute in a different way. For example, a hardware vendor can donate hardwares and researchers can build uh, new algorithms or products. A developer can build an application and they can deploy them in the production environment and they can um, get the insights about their products or or their approaches, and also get the real life, uh, uh, real user feedback uh, from these clouds. All right. Uh, so MOC is an active op open cloud exchange where we have different hardware vendors like Intel, Red Hat, and Cisco uh, who contributed uh, in terms of hardware. And then we have researchers from Har Harvard, MIT, BU who are building uh, uh, research projects and products uh, in MOC. We have uh, OpenStack, OpenShift, uh, Ceph storage system, and also ESI that I will explain in detail later. Uh, these softwares and application in production there. We have a lot of hardware. As you can see, 2,500 Intel cores and 1.5 petabyte of storage and 45 terabyte of RAM. Okay. So to have a functional open cloud exchange, you need a few components. Here we listed all of them. First is elastic secure infrastructure. What do we mean by elastic secure infrastructure is that if a user need resources and another user has access resources or free resources, they can give access uh, to these resources to the other users who want this. And uh, for a uh, open cloud exchange, I always get confused with those here. Okay, so open cloud exchange, you need a production uh, OpenStack and SAF storage system and Kubernetes services available. You also need single sign-on for to access all the OpenStack services. Uh, as we already talked about that there would be a resource sharing, you want to incentivize people who want uh, to give their resources for temporary use to others, and so you need uh, pricing and billing or incentivizing some way, credit or any uh, system like that. You also need a resource federation between different OpenStack services, and in the end you also need a system for onboarding and managing users. Okay, so out of these goals, we were able to hit some of them during the summer 2019. We implemented Elastic Secure Infrastructure, uh, which allows uh, users to give access to their resources to other users who need them. And then we also build a, build a marketplace where consumers who need resources come and record, uh, like in terms of a bid or requirement, they submit their requirements that, hey, I want these many nodes with these hardware specs for this much time. And then you match them with the offers that you come th uh, that you get through ESI. And then you give access uh, to the people, consumers, to these nodes. And we build both of them as OpenStack services. So our OpenStack is also live. So uh, before going into the details of uh, demo and Flux, we will just want you to get familiarized with some of the terms that we will be using. Uh, a user is any person with appropriate keystone authentication or a Flux user or a OpenStack user. Hardware owners are the people who own the nodes in OpenStack. 
and an offer is a record where uh, uh, in the flox market place where uh, uh, a record that comes through the ESI that says that this hardware is available for this much time at this price. Uh, bids is the requirement coming from a user, a uh, consumer that wants the uh, wants to use the hardware, and contracts are the binding between the bidders and the offer offerers. And projects are flocks uh, like Keystone projects, same multi-tenant, ironic. All right. Um, so during the summer, we wanted to build flocks so that hardware owners. Uh, can offer access to their nodes, and a consumer can come and specify their needs, and then our flocks will match these bids and offers, and then uh, create contracts. And after the contract is uh, in place, the pe person who won the bid or who got matched, they can access uh, to the uh, to the nodes uh, using Ironic. And we also wanted a web API to make everything functional for the users. And we were able to hit all of these goals during the summer. And we have a live marketplace, uh, which we call Flox, uh, in MOC. We used uh, Horizon Web uh, graphical user interface uh, that exposes uh, to the user the Flox uh, API. We deployed all of this in standard OpenStack using Keystone Authentication Service and Horizon uh, user interface plugin. And we made possible the access using Ironic Node properties and Nova filters. Uh, while we were implementing, we also took some assumptions. Here are all of them. Uh, we assume that there is only one single OpenStack instance. Uh, all the hardware is same, homogeneous pools of bare metal servers, and also all the nodes in the cloud are standard, like they have standard storage and the network facilities. So here is a like a higher level view of how flocks work. We see that there is a hardware owner. This can be any project owner or anyone who owns some nodes. Let's say they own these server one, server two, and server three in an open stack. Or, and they want to offer any of these server for up for a grab for any other user who wants to use it. So they will, OK. So what they will do, they will create an offer, and they send it to the marketplace. Uh, and they will also pull the ironic configuration. And they will attach it to the offer, and they would put it here in the marketplace. So that will go into the offer record. And then uh, a hardware consumer comes in. Let's say it's a researcher who wants to run some algorithm on some number of nodes with particular hardware configurations. Uh, so they will specify, I want this many nodes with this much CPU architect or this much memory or story or whatever they want. Uh, that will come here in bits. Then periodically we have a service called managing service that would run and they will see, okay, how many offers I got or how many servers I have that are up for grab. And then they will look at what are the bids, what are people want, and then they will match them. And in case there is a match, it will create a contract and put it in the contract uh, record. And after the contract is in place, this consumer can access these nodes using Ironic. OK, here's a more elaborate example of the same thing. Let's say we have a hardware owner who owns a server whose nodes, node ID is 456. Uh, so they will come to the Flux uh, system uh, through OpenStack or Keystone uh, authentication. And let's say first they try to offer some other node that they don't that doesn't belong to them. So because this uh, hardware owner owns the node, which is four, five, six, but they are trying to offer one, two, three, the OpenStack service will say, well, you can't offer this because you don't own this uh, node. But if this uh, user try to offer the node they own. OpenStack, uh, uh, our provider service, will pull the ironic configuration and create an offer record. 
And then let's say the consumer comes in. Uh, consumer also logs in using Keystone authentication. Uh, and then it creates a bid that I want this uh, resource uh, with these many configurations, uh, with these configurations. Let's say those configurations that the consumer wants matches the offer or 456 server. So in case there is a match, we'll have a contract in place, and then this, this consumer can access to this node through the ironic. Okay. So while all of these all of the these transactions are happening, like offers are coming to the Flux marketplace, uh, there are bids, contracts are being created, access is being granted. All of this happening in Flux marketplace, and Flux uh, records all of these things, and we are working on a user interface that will show all of these, like history or report uh, that will show uh, the summary of whatever happened. So. I explained how Flux works and how we implement it. Now Min will talk about how we implemented Flux as a combination of two services, uh, Marketplace and ESI. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ali. Okay, so uh, uh, when we implemented this, uh, we implemented two uh, FlockX OpenStack services, um, a provider service that offers resources to the marketplace and also is in charge of giving bidders access to any contracted resources. And then we also have a marketplace service which uh, receives bids offers, uh, matches the bids and offers, and if there's a match, it creates a contract. So one natural question might be, why do we have two different services here? Um, the answer is because um, although for the summer we're assuming both of these reside within the same OpenStack. In the longer term, our goal is to have individual provider services, each running on separate instances of OpenStack, all feeding up into a single marketplace service, which manages, which manages uh, uh, contracts for every single provider in that system. So that's our long-term goal, and that's what we design around. Um, one other point I want to highlight here is that we are developing these services uh, wholly within the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, we're using Keystone for authentication. Uh, this integrates with Ironic, the bare metal service. And we're also using um, OpenStack ASO uh, uh, libraries, uh, those libraries being like the generic libraries that OpenStack asks people to use for OpenStack services. Um, so I'm going to talk about the services in a second, but first I had to talk about one requirement that we do have, which is a multi-tenant Ironic. Um, so multi -ten Ironic um, in OpenStack is not tenant aware. It doesn't have the a concept of this node belongs to this user and this other node this belongs to this other user. Um, as far as Ironic is concerned, it's all belongs to, it's all accessible to whoever administrates the OpenStack, and that just doesn't work for us. So what we had to do was we had to simulate a multi-tenant Ironic, and for Unfortunately, we found a way to do this that did not involve hacking a bunch of internal ironic code or anything like that. Um, our solution is stuff that, um, that, that you can do right now with OpenStack without changing any of your internal OpenStack services. And what we did is we took advantage of the fact that ironic nodes, nodes have, um, has an attribute that's a properties that's just a dictionary where you put anything you want in it. And so for us, uh, we put in a project owner ID, which matches the, uh, the owner of that hardware, and the project ID, which is intended to be set to whatever consumer now has access to that node. So on the consumer side, we have a custom Nova filter that controls provisioning access to the node based on the project. So if you're, if you're in prior project A and you try provision, um, provision an instance, um, Nova will only look for bare metal nodes where project ID is set to A. Uh, on the flip side, for hardware owners, um, we limit Ironic API access through ASO, ASO files. Um, in short, what that means is that hardware owners cannot use the Ironic API whatsoever. But if they do need to administrate their nodes, we've created custom uh, Mistral workflows which mirror the Ironic API. Um, they do the exact same thing as the Ironic API, except that they use project owner ID to control the access. So they'll check the, that the owner's uh, project matches the project set in project owner ID. So built on top of that is our first, our provider service, and this allows owners to create offers and publishes these offers to the marketplace. Um, there's also a web API for operations on offers and contracts, and there's also a manager service, and this manager service runs independently, and it, it's in charge of expiring offers and contracts once the end date is reached. It also needs to be able to grab contracts from the marketplace, and then once that contract start date uh, is reached, it fulfills the contracts by saying, uh, certain ironic node properties, um, the project ID. 
On top of that, there's a the marketplace service, and this is where consumers create bids for resources. Uh, so the marketplace also manages a database of offers, bids, and contracts, um, has a web API for operations on all that stuff, and it too has a manager service. Um, this, this service is in charge of expiring uh, offers, bids, and contracts, and there's also a job that is in charge of matching offers with bids, and if an offer and a bid match, they, um, it creates a contract. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail, detail about the marketplace matcher. Um, so the way the matcher works is that each offer for a node includes information about the node's attributes, like the, the disk, the memory, stuff like that. Um, bids um, uh, contain a server query, and that server query is an array of JMES path expressions. And you can see two examples there. You can say CPUs has to be equal to 32, or local disk has to be greater than 512. Um, so this is a very flexible system. Um, you can you can do string matching. You can do a, bunch, a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, the matcher will match an offer against a bid. And if there's a match, it'll create a contract. So the advantage of the system is that you know it handles current node attributes, and then later on, if we if uh, for whatever reason our uh, a marketplace or a provider decides it needs to add more node attributes, this system will handle that. And on the flip side, um, if you want to limit the choice for a, for a user and how they bid, say like you want only want a user to be able to exactly specify the amount of CPUs, then you can just set in the GUI, say, say have a GUI for the bid, say you have to specify the number of CPUs, and then the GUI will just uh, create a gem ES path expression for you. So it's a very flexible way of doing things. And now um, Jacob is going to talk about the GUI that he worked on. Okay, um, I worked on the Flux user interface, which allows um, hardware owners and users to um, create offers on their nodes and then create bids and get access to those ironic nodes. Um, it was implemented using Horizon, which is another like um, part of OpenStack, um, which means you can go to the OpenStack like Horizon web-based UI, and it will just be there as in one of the tabs. Um, you can see the status on all your ironic nodes, um, and if you're a hard owner, you can create offers, you can create bids if you're a consumer, and then when those um, offers and bids are matched into a contract, you can also have a tab for that to list those. Um, two important things to mention is that it's still under development, um, so there's going to be a lot more features, which we haven't implemented yet, but for the purposes of this demo, it has all the functionality required. Um, and the other thing is that later, since there's the provider and the, um, the marketplace, there's going to be two plugins, but again, for the demo, they were merged into one plugin. Um, we also added a reporting tab, so as a hardware owner or an admin, you can view um, the offered time which you have offered um, of various nodes, and you can see um, how long they were contracted for. Um, and so you can see um, if the z-score is closer to 1, um, then that means it was used for more of the time. Um, and there's also for consumer, and then overall for the marketplace, you can see the marketplace ratio. Um, and that will tell you that, the again, the closer it is to 1, the more time that is being used for the time base that is offered. So looking ahead for Flocks, we intend to have Flocks deployed over multiple OpenStack instances. So we, the vision is to have the marketplace exist on one OpenStack instance, and then a hardware owner on his own OpenStack instance with his own pre-configured ironic setup would be able to start up a provider service and be able to connect to the marketplace over an internet connection. And then the marketplace would be able to handle um, contracts spanning over multiple provider services. So we also intend to have uh, expand the matching system and the offers and bid system. So we want to be able to allow hardware owners, say, to offer up hardware over a periodic interval, so, uh, say, uh, three hours every day from this time to this time, and the offer would persist every day, and people can come on and make bids on it on these periodic offers. Um, we also want the marketplace to be able to support requests for network and storage resources. Say a consumer comes on and says that they that their project is going to need this much bandwidth. We want the marketplace to be able to accommodate for these needs. 
we want to be we want to have the reporting system so the report shown in this demo is only a mock-up but we want to be able to actually create it and we need to account for different errors that might occur that might stop a contract from being fulfilled such as say a power outage which prevents a hardware owner or pre that prevents a consumer from connecting to the hardware and the long-term vision is to have this fully deployed on the MOC and the MGHPCC. Flux was designed with universities and their scaling needs for hardware. So at different times, a research group may or may not need a lot of hardware a lot of time. And we want people to be able to make use of this hardware and not just have it sitting around collecting dust. We also want the marketplace to support real financial transactions where people actually receive some kind of monetary compensation for putting up hardware and people who make bids will have to pay in order to use such hardware. We want to enable organizations to deploy an agent to monitor the marketplace and to act accordingly to view, say, the, how the marketplace is changing and how particular hardware is doing. And we want to uh, create a system for um, social welfare projects. So say uh, a nonprofit organization will be able to consume and make bids onto the marketplace at a reduced price. So be a part of Flux. Uh, this is a link to the GitHub. It's, uh, it's an open source project. Feel free to make a pull request to open an issue and get involved. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Min for the demo. Hey. So this is a fun part where we see if everything actually works or if it all crash and burn. <laughs> That's right. Um, so live demo. So we're starting um, on, on uh, Horizon uh, login. So I'm going to log in as a consumer who is healthily named consumer, apparently. Um, so I'm going to follow the demo flow that we talked about in the presentation. But there's going to be one or two extra steps, which I'll call out just to illustrate the additional points. So. This consumer logs in, and he's an optimist, and they they know that there's um, that this OpenStack uh, instance has bare metal nodes available, and what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and provision a Nova instance on top of one of those bare metal nodes. This is also not quite production hardware, if you can't tell, but it's all it's all live. Um, so we're going to create an instance and. The consumer is psychic, so he's going to call it the instance fail. Um, second. Sorry. Let me. Action instance. Uh, I'm create a volume. I'm going to set uh, the image and the flavor. Um, to make it, uh, to have a provision on top of bare metal, you had to select the bare metal flavor. So we're going to do that, select that, and launch it and see what happens. So the instance creation is scheduled, and we wait a few seconds to see what happens. So it is scheduling, and it should fail nearly right away. And the error is no valid host was found. There are not enough hosts available. There's a generic uh, Nova error if it tries to schedule an instance and there's, uh, it, can't, it can't find a place to put it. Um, and the reason is because we're using FlockX. And although there are bare metal nodes, uh, none of them have been made available to this user. So what does this user need to do? Uh, they need to wait for an owner to offer up a node. So I'm going to log out and log back in as the owner. And again, like this, uh, the owner and the consumer here are both using the same uh, UI. Um, our, our goal is to eventually separate out the two UIs um, because the owner is mainly interacting with the provider service, and the consumer is interacting with the marketplace service. So you can see like kind of a mix of functionality that in reality will be separated out. So here is the owner. We will go to the FlockX tab. Here you see a whole bunch of nodes. Now, this owner actually only um, owns one of these nodes, the last one. So normally, they probably would not see all four of these nodes. But we've put it up here for illustration purposes. What happens if this owner tries to offer, let's say, this top node that they don't own for, let's say, 12 to 4, or create offer? And you see a whole bunch of nothing happened. What really happened behind the scenes is that um, uh, the, the provider threw an error saying that you, that, uh, that you tried to offer up a node you don't own. And just to prove that that happened, I'm going to go into the database, do a database query. And we can see that there's been no new offer created. Um, so uh, 
Now this owner is going to offer a node that they do own. And we're going to want, we're going to specify a fairly short period, I suppose. And then create this offer. And you can right away see that this offer was created because the UI is updated. Now this node is marked as available, meaning that there's an offer out for it. So now that this, that offer exists, let's go back to the consumer. So the consumer will go to the FlockX tab. Go to the bid section, and here you can see the wreckage, the past hopes and dreams, all these expired bids. Um, but now they're going to create a new bid. Um, let's just make sure it's for a reasonable time, three to four. Well, let's say, yeah, three to four. So here's where um, the the, um, uh, the consumer would be able to set like uh, 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 what query, what what sort of uh, node you're looking for. So for example, exactly uh, 32 CPUs, and let's say they want their local disk to be over 9,000. Wow! So we're going to create this bid and see what happens. So this bid has been created and it's available. And behind the scenes. There's, I'm going to show you the log file for the Flack X manager, and you can see that there's a period job, periodic job that matches the bids and offers. So um, we're just going to, it's, uh, I've said to run every 15 seconds, so we're just going to wait a little bit, wait for it to run, and see if it matched, um, if it matched the bid. So it just ran. Uh, so let's go back to the dashboard, see what happened. I'm going to reload. And the bid is still available. That means it has not matched. Um, it, it's, it's still open for another to be matched with another uh, with another offer. And that's because this user specified over 9,000 disks. That doesn't exist. Um, uh, they'll be sad. So now let's try again. This time let's specify something a little more reasonable. And create the bid. And this bid has been created uh, right up here. So now we're going to go back and look at this log again, wait for the master to run once more. It just ran, and let's see what happens. Now we can see that this, uh, this bid is marked as busy, meaning it's been matched. And because it's been matched, um, there's a contract now that exists for it. Um, this contract, which, uh, matches the, which matches the start and end time of the bid. So what's going to happen now is that the provider uh, manager is going to try and grab this, contra uh, this contract and make a copy of it for itself. And this is uh, what happens here. And you can see that it's already ran. It's created the contract. And then um, there's another uh, manager job that fulfills a contract when the start date uh, is passed. And because I said the start date to the past, it's already been fulfilled. This contract has been fulfilled, meaning that the relevant ironic node now has that consumer's project marked in his project ID uh, field. And we should be now be able to uh, provision using that node. So now this consumer is going to go back. attempt to launch a successful instance. And this instance is launched, and if all goes well, um, uh, you'll see that uh, Nova has scheduled it, and it's going to start doing a whole bunch of Nova things, networking and stuff like that. Yep, it's built, scheduling, and now it's networking, meaning that it's been able to provision on top of that node.
Um, so that concludes our demo. Um, if you guys have any questions, we would be happy to answer them. So I'm uh, passing the mic for the first question, but just as we continue, if anyone else has questions, like uh, like we did here, raise your hand and um, try to move to the end of the aisle if possible, and I'll pass the mic to you. So very cool. Um, any thought about doing the same type of thing in an open shift environment? Sorry. Uh, open shift versus open stack, like containerized versus VMs. Uh, so this 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 isn't really much about that. The OpenShift would be something that might run on top of them stack. It's it, 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 this doesn't cover any of that. This is completely about uh, about the about the the elastic secure infrastructure, about being able to manage your own infrastructure, being for owners to offer the resources up for others to use, and for consumers to be able to grab them and be able to to use them for whatever they want. Yeah. There is a proposal to expand the uh, project so that it would actually also be able to allocate containers across multiple nodes, yes, in the same kind of way. But we would like the bare metal stuff to work first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, is there an, um, is there a plan to also this whole bidding and offering that I would like th that to be completely automated? Like I don't want to sign in somewhere and see something. I just want like some little program to take care of that. I just want to put a switch like whenever there's space available, offer it up or something like that. Yeah, this is part of what's meant by um, more complex offering and bidding systems. So and also the agents that can manage the marketplace. So we want to um, allow the uh, different offers just be posted periodically and just exist on like a periodic interval if you want, or end to be able to make bids on a periodic interval and you would be able to set up like an agent to just kind of automate that process for you. So you don't have to manually go in every day and say, I want this available at 3 p.m. like, and then reset it up every day and check if it matched or not and take it down. That, that A lot of these processes would be automated and the marketplace would be able to match and accommodate for these as well. Sorry, if you couldn't tell, I'm also involved in this project. Um, so we actually would like to get to even more sophisticated, like full-on futures market uh, kind of models. Um, but you know, basically, what we were trying to do for the summer was get the groundwork laid, and then we can start. Then we'll actually have something to build on. Uh, and you know, I think uh, autonomous agents start to become more interesting, and also looking at kind of general-purpose schedulers, uh, you know, that basically tolerate market fluctuations, uh, start getting interesting, um, especially if you go to Ali's other talk tomorrow, <laughs> which is about serverless and trying to do uh, similar things with functions. to tenant piece of this is, I think, partially implemented. Um, can you describe the state of that in general? So uh, in the latest cycle, um, they added an owner ID field. Um, uh, sorry, uh, they added an owner ID field, uh, equivalent to project owner ID field. They didn't hook it up to anything yet. Um, so there's interest, but maybe not a ton of interest. So this may be something that we all will have to try and implement ourselves with an ironic to get officially supported. Um, but I, like, I would like to point out that like once they do that, you know, the back end code that needs to change here is not that much. Instead of saying uh, instead of saying one property on Rock, we'll be saying a different property on Rock, and uh, things will just continue to move along smoothly. So whatever change they decide to do, it's very easy for us to adapt to that change on our side. 
so a quick follow up on that. Um, right now, when I if I bid for a bear, for a, a, a machine or a group of machines like this, and I get them, what's actually going on behind the scenes? When you, in order for me to for me the user to have the machines and be able to use them for something what's happening in the background so what's happening in the background is that there's a there's a property being set in the in the in the property dictionary from wrong node that matches that bidders um, that bidders uh, that bidders project and I, I'm assuming you mean once a contract uh, contract is fulfilled not when the bid is created um, and so when that uh, when that project ID is set we also have a nova filter and that nova filter uh, when, the, when the user tries to provision on top of these bare metal nodes, this Nova filter will filter out any node that whose project ID doesn't match that user's project. I'm monopolizing the mic, I'm sorry. And then Nova at that point proceeds to reboot the machine yeah, in order Nova. to give it to the user. Or uh, uh, Sorry, say that one time. The Nova at that point proceeds to um, re reboot the machine via Ironic in order to hand it off to the user and provision it with whatever. The Nova, uh, actually, Nova itself will do the provisioning. But, right, but okay. Yes. Great project. Thank you for doing all of this. Appreciate it. Uh, my question really is if somebody has a cluster of nodes, can they use the Flock software to manage them and have an internal bid and ask and provisioning setup? Like we just can we just take the software layer of this and use it? So, uh, are you asking if, uh, if so? You have a you have a cluster of nodes, presumably in OpenStack, understood by Ironic. You're asking if you can use the software. We just have a imagine 32 nodes powered up. That's all. So, in, so you're asking if you could do all of this, but not necessarily have like a cost component or anything like that. Yeah, there's no no, no reason why you couldn't. Yeah, so I just would add that, like the cost component part of it, you you somewhat want it for the uh, the audit factor, but it doesn't actually have to equal money, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on, which um, I don't know if you guys could open the GitHub repo for the documentation. Um, you know, both of of the guys over here on the ends who talked about kind of potential enhancements. Uh, if you could go file issues against the project, uh, kind of talking about where you'd want to see it go, uh, those would be really useful in helping us to prioritize. And then we can also get outside feedback because right now right it's just a bunch of us thinking about the problem ourselves the primary driver here is around trying to do kind of academic uh, sharing of hardware um, but there's a lot more here I actually think like Rush's case is very interesting where you have a bunch of yahoos who you know I got six servers in my basement and I want to kind of allocate them and make five bucks here and there and be able to allocate them to the SETI project right so I just wanted to make that comment. That's the project. Uh, please do file issues. All right.